Hello and welcome to the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture's webinar Wednesday. Today we'll hear from Valerie Rangel on her book, Environmental Justice in New Mexico. Valerie Rangel earned a Master of Community Regional Planning degree that carried an emphasis in natural resources and environmental planning with concentrated coursework in public health and indigenous planning. Her education involved environmental science, Southwest history, Native American studies, and cultural anthropology. During her graduate professional project and thesis, she worked with university scholars and faculty, tribal and US government officials in an investigation of environmental land use, ethnographic history and future planning of the repatriated Fort Wingate Army Depot activity area located near Gallup, New Mexico. The professional project report that resulted recommended planning policy changes, tribal self-determination, environmental restoration implementation strategies, natural alternatives to contamination cleanup, and public health education curriculum for the immediate health threats posed by the legacy of contamination in the area. Valerie presently works as an environmental planning and public health assessment consultant and community program manager for the state's nonprofit community foundation. She also volunteers as a river steward and a social justice activist. I just wanted to mention that if you have questions during the presentation, please share them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll make sure we get to those at the end of the talk. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Valerie. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you, Andy. I'd first like to thank the leadership of Della Warrior and the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture team for their continued support of Native youth and families. Thank you also for inviting me here today to share this presentation with you all. The reason why I wrote the book was really to spark a conversation. And it was intended for the Native youth. I wanted the content that's presented today to highlight the importance of what our ancestors have done and also to remind the youth to continue this great leadership. The world needs your creative ideas and your advocacy. I'm going to share my presentation with you now. Andy, can I do this screen share? It says the host is able participant screen sharing. Um, not just yet. I don't see it yet. Okay, it says that the host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, try it now. Okay, thank you so much. I think we got it now. Okay, here we go. I want to take you on a little tour of my book just to show you some highlights. These are stories that come from um, Native communities. And I'm very pleased to be able to, to have the cover work on this book by contributing Native artists. Up to the left, there's an oil painting by Craig George of the Navajo Nation. Two photos to the right of it are Dan Budnick, who was a photographer that documented the Church Rock spill for 30 years. To the left is the Trinity Bomb, and the Palace of the Gallaners, Governors was gracious enough to let me use this as an archival photo for the book. Below that is a veteran from the Chula Rosa Downwinders. And to the right is another Navajo artist, Nani Chacon, who has done beautiful murals across our state. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Just to remind you that the content of the book really is meant to spark the conversation of the viewers and the readers. I hope that it also inspires you to do something. There are many ways to advocate um, and donate, volunteer, learn more, educate your friends and others. That's really what activism is. <clears throat> I'd also like to remind you that for those who are watching the presentation and know about what's happening with the COVID virus in our state, it's hitting Native communities the most. There are presently two funds that you can offer your support. One is through the Indian Public Cultural Center, who has set up a Native Public Relief Fund. 
The other is the New Mexico Foundation, which has a Native American relief fund that is uh, supporting all the tribal nations within New Mexico and also or the urban Indian population. So take a moment, if you would, for those who are reading, to look at this statement. New Mexico is an example of the kinds of issues that have plagued Indian country for quite some time, really all communities of colors for many, many decades. The cruel irony is that indigenous people across the globe continue to fight in a constant war to defend the integrity of the natural world, to protect what is sacred, and this includes women, children, the sick, the elderly. They also fight for religious freedom and the continuation of language and culture, which are closely tied to the land. The photo below is a 1930s shot of Albuquerque, which you see is mostly rural and farming. Up above is Nora Naranjo Morris's Mumbewagi, the landscape architecture piece, which is a reminder of our center place. It's really about our role in the web of life. And it's also a homage to the traditional summer place, which the Pueblo people gathered, which is located on 12th and Mountain, if you should go to the History Museum and take a look at it, take a walk through it, it's wonderful. Nora also is an advocate to protect the sacred. It's important to recognize that environmental stewardship and the great pouring of love and respect and protection of resources by indigenous caretakers is something that's been happening since time immemorial. The concept of protecting the sacred is not something new. It is an understanding and it's a reverence that is carried forward by all the tribes today. It really is a great injustice to see the vandalism and urban sprawl damage and erase these cultural resources. There is a sensitive ecological habitat in the Petroglyph National Monument. And we should be concerned with not just the physical cultural resources, but also the ecological integrity. For more information about what the petroglyphs mean, I encourage you to look at Greg Ahith's book, Native Science. He explains a lot more about the significance. <clears throat> and just as a reminder that these petroglyphs are historical re recordings. They were made by native scientists and religious practitioners. Some of them are thousands of years old, if not hundreds. Many tribal leaders have voiced their concern for the protection of historic sites. They have been actively working with federal and state policymakers to ensure the protection. And Bandelier may soon have a protection of national park status should high risk bill be passed. This would protect not only traditional hunting grounds, but also with this new designation, the cultural site itself would be protected from oil and gas drilling. Pueblo and Navajo leaders have both expressed their concerns regarding the oil and gas fracking activities in Chaco Canyon, not only for the health of the surrounding communities, but also water sources above and below the ground. It's important also to have access to pollution free skies, which is crucial for traditional practices that are carried on today. The Gila River is one of the very few wild rivers left in the United States. Human occupation of the land dates back thousands of years ago, with groups of early inhabitants finding shelter within the canyons of the caves and the Gila Basin. <clears throat> the photo above is the 10th Infantry crossing the Gila River in 1885, <clears throat> and below is a band of Apaches crossing the same river not too long ago. Many several tribes have connections uh, to the area, but especially the Apaches. And Geronimo is said to have been born along the Gila. This river is a rare ecological beauty. The bioregion of the Gila wilderness contains a river that floods with seasonal fluctuation. 
It provides shelter to endemic species and a rich diversity of plants and organisms, thereby creating a complex and thriving ecosystem. The off-roading that happens, the introduction of roads that are continuing to expand to the wilderness, the uncertainty of water flow due to climate change, and also now demands for water from the expansion of farming upstream presently threaten the future of the Gila. <clears throat> I'd like to shift <clears throat> to recognize Verna Teller. She has a profound statement about environmental use being that it's a spiritual one. Verna became the first woman governor of an Indian Pueblo in 1986. She led her tribe during her term in a victorious battle over religious freedom and public health. The photo below is a waffle garden, which is a traditional dry farming practice that continues today. The Rio Grande River flows through the tribe into the lands, uh, right into the heart of the Pueblo, which still continues to grow food for the community through small farming practices today. The Pueblo of Isleta became the first tribe to assert its right under federal law to establish its own water quality standards. These are stricter standards than the EPA, and they have inspired other sovereign nations to set their own water quality standards as well. The Supreme Court ruled that the city of Albuquerque must comply to ensure that the water that's flowing from the city downstream to his letter just 15 minutes away meets the standards set by the tribe. This is a photo of the Rio Grande. Diminishing water quality and also the flow of the Rio Grande Basin has been an environmental justice issue for many, many years. Communities upstream rely on the water for farming using acequias to water the fields. And it's important also, like I make the point down here, that there's more to water quality than just the microbes and uh, what's in the water. It's the clarity, it's the look, it's the smell, the taste. Uh, back in 2013, there were kayakers that noted floating carcasses of dogs, dead fish, and some people have reported bodies within this river. Great concern. Downstream communities include aquatic organisms and plants and animals which are rarely allocated the supply that they need. This impairs ecological functions and the riparian system, which naturally provides all the filtration of water and nutrients that we so, we so need. We also create a lot of legal issues with not having continuous flow in the river. We're in battle with Texas. The Rio Grande Corridor includes some of the most disenfranchised communities in the United States. In Anthony, which is south of Las Cruces, farmers can afford to purchase water from other sources than the river, and the wells that are just adjacent along the river are running dry. The communities also on the border can afford the wastewater treatment to deal with the polluted waters coming downstream. The history and policies and practices towards indigenous people have set a precedent for the issues regarding land grants, treaty lands, treaty rights, water and mineral rights. So let me remind you of this type of policy framework. It has included the US government's treatment of indigenous communities from 1800s to early 1900s. There have been policies of relocation land grabbing, eradication, and a forced dissimulation practices, which have created significant health crises that are related to starvation, infectious disease, inadequate housing, mistreatment, as well as substantial loss uh, at the hands of the military. These experiences resonate with the New Mexico indigenous communities and are a deep source of intergenerational trauma and mistrust in the federal government today. Leonard Peltier's statement in 1976 is a pertinent one. 
It's a reminder that much of the lands of the Southwest region and most of the tribal lands where communities reside today were considered worthless at one point in time. And yet, the four corners of, the, of New Mexico was deemed a national sacrifice zone. In 1973, President Nixon was trying to deal with an energy crisis at that time. So the Four Corners became a sacrifice zone and folks exploited the use of coal and uranium. Navajo miners were used as a cheap source of labor. And although, although the dangers of uranium and although the dangers of uranium were known to human health at the time, during the 1930s and 40s, Navajo miners were not warned of the dangers to their health or the health of their families. As a result, there have been many generations that have experienced health disparities and the suffering continues today. Past research has identified uranium exposures as a possible contributor to issues such as genetic deformations, various types of cancer, vascular problems, and kidney disease. Communities that have been hardest hit by COVID during this time just happen to be in uranium contaminated areas of San Juan and McKinley County in New Mexico. The truth about the discovery, the great discovery, is that there were significant amounts of people, communities of color who were living in the area and farming and ranching in the areas of Los Alamos, and around the Trinity site at the time that the atomic bomb was tested. Folks in Mescalero were shaken out of bed and they experienced ash falling out of the sky for days. There was a foam that floated down the river. The communities remember what has happened and they also experienced health issues as a result. Downstream communities continue to experience health and safety risks due to the lack of cleanup of the lab's waste, as well as nuclear research that continues to generate waste piles and contaminant discharges. They eventually find their way into our water system, through our arroyos, into the rivers and into the ocean, and eventually feeding our crops and our people. It's surprising to me that the New Mexico downwinders have never been included in the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act Fund. The people of New Mexico were the very first downwinders, a population of more than 40,000 indigenous and communities of color in Otero, Lincoln, Socorro, and Sierra counties. They were the first victims of the July 14, 1945 atomic bomb. These residents were unknowing, unwilling, uncompensated, innocent participants in the world's largest scientific experiment. The Tularosa Downwinders Consortium recently conducted a health impact assessment to inform the public and policymakers about health outcomes since the bomb. There are a variety of cancers that have cropped up over many generations and they wanted to advocate for an amendment to the act to include New Mexico communities. Presently, it's only Nevada and Arizona. The Trump administration has recently approved the expansion of WIP, which will store more nuclear waste. And given that New Mexico uh, has Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is functioning and operational, it has granted them a sizable chunk of money to continue to test and develop nuclear weaponry further. Let me remind you that these decisions are quite deliberate. It is by no accident that they are placed here. And although the region is considered sparse and unpopulated, many people continue to live here, have been, have cultural ties and connections that are unbreakable. After the Navajo Long Walk, Fort Wingate became a distribution point for rations, uh, food rations. 
for the population. I just, if you don't know where Fort Wingate is located, it's right next to Church Rock, about 15 minutes to the east of Gallup. Fort Wingate became a BIA school, and then later it became a storage house for weapons from all different kinds of wars. There were ammunitions from mustard gas to old TNT, and they had, had tested advanced missiles. They repackaged missiles, they disposed of them, they tested them, and they stored them. That is until aerial photography and satellite imagery compromised national security. And therefore these bunkers are now recognized for what they are, but they still remain in place dotting the landscape. Many tribal communities have borne the brunt of military testing and uranium mining. For those that are interested in military militarization in indigenous country, please read Winona Wojcik's book. Some of my thesis is in there. I uh, was focused on Church Rock and the aftermath and the planning regarding cleanup many years ago. And nothing has happened yet. And let me remind you that the Church Rock spill of July 16, 1979 was the largest uranium waste tailing spill in the United States. <clears throat> And even though the Navajo Nation has put a moratorium on uranium mining, Church Rock and Mount Taylor may see more mining in the coming years, just due to the pressures of creating more weapons and also the need for alternative sources of energy to replace oil and the coal plants that are closing, as well as the gas fracking. So I'd like to remind anyone who is interested in the legacy of uranium that there is the Nuclear Studies Issues Group in Albuquerque, headed by Leona Morgan. She's very knowledgeable. The whole team is actively pursuing what could be the largest uranium waste uh, storage site at Holtec, which is near Hobbs, a planned potential site that would store all high-level nuclear waste from the United States here in New Mexico's backyard. So we need your advocacy. We need you to be educated uh, about the history of uranium as well as what's happening today. Many, many scholars have suggested that Church Rock spill is an example of environmental racism. It's also an example of neglect from the US government who has disregarded not only the health of the people but also has failed to clean up over 500 abandoned uranium mines in the area. Before I continue on with the slides, uh, an estimated 300 oil drums were filled with contaminated soil. It basically just scraped off the yellow cake that was on the, the surface, put them into oil drums, and then hauled them away to an undisclosed location. Ceremonies are still happening on the land. Children continue to play, animals continue to drink from the real purple, and it measures at high radioactivity even today. So speaking of water, water is an essential component of all life and all culture. And the area in blue right at the center of the photo is actually a flash flood event that was organized by the 350 organization back in 19, sorry, back in uh, 2010. They gathered enough supporters around Santa Fe to advocate for a living river. Folks held up any object that they could that was blue to simulate what water would look like in the river and then they took aerial photography. So the power of the people did create change. Now the river has more water that's released from the Buckman Dam to mimic a more natural flowing river. And I think that speaks volumes, people power. According to the World Health Organization, water is a fundamental, it's, it's fundamental for a life of human dignity. It is a prerequisite to the realization of all other human rights. So then let me ask you, 
Why isn't water a basic human right in our country? Presently, there's a population of 70,000 Navajos who do not have access to safe, clean, safe sources of clean water. This means that folks are using well water that's contaminated. Sources that have been contaminated from uranium mining and also from other sources of, um, of contaminants. They're using unpotable water sources that were used for livestock and drinking from that out of need. COVID-19 has increased the difficult life of hauling water for the Navajos. Many are dealing with economic insecurity at this time, health issues, crowded housing conditions, lack of running water and sanitation. And also many of the areas located in New Mexico don't have electricity. So I ask you to think about, is water a basic human right? According to the United Nations, it is. Why isn't it in our country? Why isn't it in our own backyard? Let me remind you that the grassroots organizations that have been providing Navajo, uh, Navajo communities water have been the Navajo Utility Authority and grassroots organizations, there's been Dig Deep, who have been trucking water to communities during the pandemic, but this is not a sustainable long-term solution, nor does it address the need for structural change and also just the basic right to a life of dignity. Let me remind you about the bureaucratic forms of oppression that continue today. Native people underrepresented in the news, the continued use of mascots, the underfunding of IHS, the disproportionate health impacts, the lack of economic opportunities, and the basic belief that sovereign rights does not mean that folks uh, know what to do for themselves, which they do. Tribal communities know what's going on, they know what's best for them, and we should respect that right. So in reading this, this statement about injustice, let me remind you that the EPA's definition of what environmental justice is, is that no group of people should have to bear a disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences as a result of industrial, governmental, commercial operations, or policy. I think the map clearly shows that there's a correlation between health effects and industry. If you look at San Juan and McKinley County, where COVID is happening right now in, in high rates of cases, you'll see that they are plagued by cancer and Superfund sites. This is an area of uranium mining of the, one of the greatest areas of oil and gas and methane wells. And so therefore, environmental justice not only harms the community, it harms how we plan and how we allocate our natural resources and what's happening to our future generation. I'd like to close my book tour with a statement from uh, Bob Houses, who was gracious enough to write a forward for the book. Please take a moment to read this statement. I think that he makes an emphasis about what is counting coup. It's really something that we wanted both to participate uh, in the shedding of light upon the truth of history, the ugly truths that aren't easy to, to deal with, but it's something that needs to, to be shared with Native youth, to remind them to continue to advocate for what is sacred, to remind them of the work of their ancestors that continue to happen today, and the cultural ties that are so important, important to hang on to. The book is available also at uh, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture at the Indian Public Cultural Center at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and Arcadia Press. Some of the topics that I did not include in this presentation were illegal dumping, 
super fun sites, migrant farm workers, and also the, the preservation of other historic and cultural sites. These are examples of social environmental justice that are presented in the book, should you read it. And I'm open for any questions at this time. Andy? Yes, Valerie. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the question and answer box, but maybe we should wait 30 seconds or so to let people, um, to let people submit something. Sure. Should I flip it back to Bob's statement? Sure. Are there any questions for Valerie Rangel? I don't see anything coming in, Valerie. That's okay. I'm pleased to share. I know that the content of what I've presented are difficult issues, but it's something that it needs to, to be shared. And, and I mentioned just briefly, in the back of the book, there is an appendix of additional sources of information. And these sources of information are organizations that are currently doing work in social and environmental justice realms. So please take a look. Feel free to, to contact and reach out and find out how you can donate or volunteer or help. That's really the importance of why I'm presenting today. Um, one person said they have a question, but I'm writing, uh, waiting for them to submit it. Okay, submit it. <laughs> <laughs> Fire away. Okay, I don't know if it's coming in or not. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, Valerie, for your talk. It was really enlightening and uh, certainly does form a call to action. Oh, here's the question. Okay. How do the casinos come into this, especially with regards to water rights? Hmm. I think the question might be the use of water by casinos. Is that what it is? They're specifically, the they're specifically thinking of Kuyamange. I think it's an interesting question. Where we allocate water is is definitely something that Native you should be concerned with, as well as everyone. Are we watering golf courses with our precious resources? Are we feeding the water to casinos and to hotels uh, so that we can economically survive these times? Those are important questions. I don't have an answer. I think it's it's important for you to ask your tribal leaders to consider and weigh the options of what's needed, how we conserve and protect, and what's best for their people long term. They're thinking specifically of Cuyamungue where the Hispano Asequia farmers are having to pump from the Rio Grande because the golf courses in Buffalo Thunder take the water coming off the mountain. There you go. Yeah, that's a definite. Well, there's also the issue with land rights, right? And uh, the rights of indigenous people who have been here since time immemorial. Well, it's also a complicated issue because the sovereign nations have to decide what's best for them as well. So how do we marry the two? I don't know. I think that what would be best is for everyone to sit at the table and try to find a balance. I know that downstream communities are suffering because there isn't enough water in the Rio Grande and climate change is definitely altering our precipitation patterns and how much water we have. We're sucking dry our, our resources below the ground so and contaminating them. All of these things are impacting um, our present generations, but we also have to think seven generations ahead. Uh, I would definitely call everyone together and see how 
how we could best resolve it. Okay. Any doesn't, other questions? Uh, was... It doesn't appear that there are any other questions. So we'll conclude this now. Once again, thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.